Zulu were a relatively minor tribe who lived in a region in what would now be the eastern part of South Africa. They had a largely pastoral economy with wealth being measured in cattle and the population mostly subsisting on maize and milk. They operated under a kingship, but they had very little in the way of what we would consider centralized governance. What about war? In the end of the 18th century, warfare in this region was more of a ritual affair than a destructive endeavor. Warriors would meet at a predetermined location and fling spears and insults at one another, but would rarely move in for close quarters fighting. This left the casualties very light, and it was almost unheard of for the winning side to follow up a victory by chasing down their opponents or sacking or conquering their land. Instead, battles would result in the transfer of a small amount of territory, or some cattle. Thank you for supporting my channel with your likes when I ask you like right now, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press the bell. Thank you, bro. Traditional squads were armed with long throwing spears. They trained in using their weapon, but not in tactics, and on the battlefield they looked like the crowd, but not the well-coordinated combat unit. But then became Shaka. He changed the weapons, the tactics, and perhaps most importantly, the philosophy of war in the region. He brought in close quarters combat, replacing the traditional long throwing spear with a shorter thrusting spear that was devastating when used in a melee. He developed a system of envelopment tactics known as the bullhorn formation. He'd split his men into three groups, the chest, the horns, and, I'm sorry, the loins. The chest would charge the enemy and pin them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Then the two branches of the horns, positioned to either side of the chest, would flank and envelop the pinned enemy. This whole time the loins would sit behind the lines acting as a rested reserve to be applied where needed. Interestingly, it's been said that Shaka would have these men sit with their backs to the fighting so they wouldn't become panicked or charge over eagerly before he needed them. The brilliance of this system was that it was simple. Without much battlefield coordination, every man knew what he was supposed to do. If you're in the chest, you charge. If you're in the horns, you get around their flank. The system's simplicity meant that it could be applied in chaotic conditions without much of the signaling that was required by modern armies. With these deadly new weapons and tactics, Shaka became a force to be reckoned with. So who was Shaka? Shaka was the eldest son of the leader of the Zulu people, but he was considered illegitimate and so wasn't named the heir to the Zulu kingdom. In fact, his name Shaka means intestinal beetle, which was sort of the cover story for his mother's untimely pregnancy. This becomes kind of hilarious when you realize that we in the West often call him Shaka Zulu, and since the word Zulu actually means heaven in the Zulu language, we're basically calling him intestinal beetle heaven, so enjoy that. When his father died, he decided it was time to take his own. Shaka's half-brother, the legitimate heir, took the Zulu throne. Shaka quickly had him assassinated, took the Zulu throne. He did it with the support of the person whom he served before, Dingaswayo. Thus, Shaka became a leader of Zulu, but continued to serve Dingaswayo. But only a year later, Dingaswayo was killed by a man named Zweed, the ruler of the Ndwandwe, one of the most powerful tribes in the region. Shaka vowed vengeance for his leader's death and stepped in to fill the void Dingaswayo had left behind, bringing the Mthetwa and with them many of the other local tribes under his control. Shaka's vengeance and the war he was about to bring would lead to a period of unparalleled chaos and devastation. In Zulu, they call it the Mifakain. In English, we simply call it the Crushing. As Shaka took control of the Metethwa tribe, he began to spread his ideas amongst them, teaching them how to fight in Zulu fashion and having them take on the Zulu name. He instilled in this newly consolidated Zulu clan a warrior culture that had never existed before and changed them from being pastoral herdsmen to conquerors. With this, Shaka began his frequently brutal expansion outward, bringing in neighboring tribes with diplomacy when possible, but often resorting to the extremities of force. Unlike the ritual warfare of old, when his forces would engage in enemy bands, their goal was to destroy the enemy completely, and when the forces under arms were destroyed, he would march into the enemy village, often killing all the men of fighting age, assimilating only the women and children into the Zulu tribe. Finally, after training his people and expanding his reach, Shaka felt ready to take on Zweed. He arrayed his forces, about 5,000 strong, on a hill, right in the path of the oncoming Zweed army. 
They had more than twice as many men as Shaka could muster, and never before had one of the Zulu armies really been able to stand against them. Shaka, seeing his DS vantage in numbers, split a small contingent from his force and used it to lure off a sizable portion of the enemy's army. But the that part of Zweed's army coming toward the hill still outnumbered him. This actually turned into an advantage for Shaka, though. The enemy's forces got in each other's way as they tried to clamber up the hill in a disorganized mob. This disorder, combined with the uphill ascent, made the long throwing spears they carried useless. Five times that day, they charged the hill, and five times, they were repulsed by the smaller force. But when Chaka found out that the second part of the enemy's army ID coming, he attempted to defeat tired enemy with the help of his loins. Well, that is the resting part of his army, which, as you remember, called the loins, and which made up a third part of his army. Now, he called on them to join the horns and envelop the enemy. Seeing this large force appear as if from nowhere, the Ndwandwe began to panic. Pinned by the chest and encircled by the horns, this last column of Ndwandwe was crushed, with its tattered remnants fleeing down the hill. Shaka sent a small contingent of men to kill any Ndwandwe they could find taking water at the river, while his main force pursued the bulk of the fleeing army. But as the Ndwandwe column that had followed his diversionary force began to close in, Shaka was forced to give up the chase. The day was a bloody one. As was common in this new style of war, neither side took prisoners. As the sun set, nearly 2,000 Zulus lay dead, as did 7,500 Ndwandwe troops. But their leader, Zweed, was not among them. Zweed was not well-liked among the nearby tribes. And as cracks in the mighty Ndwandwe army began to show, Shaka was able to gain new allies and new client states for his confederacy, bolstering his numbers. After 18 more months of minor skirmishes, the final battle between the two forces came at the Mulatuz River. Shaka won that battle. Seeing his opportunity, Shaka took his forces and marched on the Ndwandwe capital before word of their army's defeat could reach them. As he approached before his men were close enough to be seen clearly from the capital, he had them start to sing Ndwandwe victory songs. Upon hearing the singing, the populace rushed out to greet them, only to be slaughtered by the oncoming forces. Zweed managed to escape, but his mother did not. Shaka locked her in a house with jackals and hyenas to eat her alive, and when the night was done, he had the house burnt to the ground, so only ash would remain. Over the coming years, Shaka continued to expand his reach and assert Zulu dominance over all the tribes in the area. He turned his confederacy into a true empire and exerted influence far beyond even the regions he could control. But all those tribes he had pushed out, all the fleeing refugees he had left behind, all the warriors he had driven from their homes, spread out like a fire across the savanna. All those men who had seen the Zulu fight adopted the Zulu way of war, and as they fled the now mighty Zulu, they inflicted the same brutality on those around them. This was the Mephikane, the crushing. These tribes that fled the Zulu either died out or formed kingdoms of their own with the same bloody tactics they had learned from the Zulu, and at an incredible price. Over the next 15 years, well over a million people would die as these refugees from the Zulu cut their way across the southern half of Africa. But by 1827, not all was right in the Zulu kingdom. Shaka's mother, the parent who had raised him, died, and he went mad with grief. Sources report him ordering that no grain be planted for a year, that any woman who got pregnant was to be executed along with her husband, that milk was not to be gathered from their cattle. It's said that he had 7,000 people killed for not grieving enough, that he had cows slaughtered so that their calves would know what it was like to lose a mother. It goes without saying that shortly after this, he was assassinated by his brothers. They'd been trying to get rid of him for some time anyway. But, as so often happens with these things, his two brothers shortly became one brother, as there's just not enough room for two on the throne. And so, a man named Dingane became the leader of the Zulu Empire. After either bribing or killing anybody still loyal to Shaka, Dingane faced a new threat. Dutch settlers, pushed east by the British colonial efforts in South Africa, began to enter Zululand. At first, relations appeared cordial, with the Dutch helping to recover some 7,000 cattle from Dingane's enemies in return for land in the Zulu territory. 
But when the Dutch came to Dingani's capital to sign the agreement, in the midst of a ceremonial dance, Dingani shouted to have them seized and dragged off to a nearby hill where they were all clubbed to death. Dingani then sent troops off to massacre the now undefended Dutch wagon train. As is so often the case, none of this ends well for anybody. The Dutch sent out another wagon train, but this one full of nothing but fighters. In what's now known as the Battle of Bloody River, over 10,000 Zulus attacked the circled wagons of the Dutch. But with only their short spears to fight with, and on poor terrain, funneled into a killing plain, 3,000 Zulus lay dead by the end of the day, and only three of the Dutch were even wounded. This battle broke the back of Dingani's forces. The last remaining half-brother of Dingani, who had fled with thousands of his followers, after seeing how Dingani treated the rest of his relatives, now came storming back, and the Dutch immediately became his allies. In the end, he crushed Dingani, and he himself took over the leadership of the Zulu. He established a wary peace with the Dutch settlers, granting them land in return for their aid, and began his reign in relative tranquility. Next video, we'll find out just how that peace turned out and follow the lengthy reign of the new Zulu king, Mpande. If you like the video, subscribe and write in comments which topics you want to see next. Thank you, bro.